to dominate women. No comment. It's easier to dominate young and girls. No comment. This is the voice of a killer. A violent psychopath who attacked women and young girls over a 40-year period. He's clever. He knew he was going to kill my daughter. He had it all planned. In my opinion, uh, he's subject to an explosive psychopathic disorder, which makes him very dangerous. This is the story of a family who live in hope that one day they'll find the body of their missing sister. Because Arling deserves, deserves like a decent burial. And like we deserve to have a life of our own, Let's see which we haven't had as 15 years. And it's the story of one detective's determination to catch a killer. In my view, he's committed a, a number of um, offences and it's quite likely that he's not um, answered for all of those. Um, so I think uh, Robert Howard was and will remain a very dangerous man. On a Saturday morning in April 2001, 14-year-old Hannah Williams left her home in Deptford in London to go to the local market. She was never seen again. She was very kind and, and loving and funny and loved music, dancing around, singing on her karaoke. And at times we used to always go out together, looking in shops, Mum, can I have this? Mum, can I have that? <laughs> yeah, um, that's it really, she's just 14 year old. Hannah had been sexually abused by a former boyfriend of her mother's when she was a very young child. She was again described as a vulnerable child. She had learning difficulties, um, but she obviously was very much loved by her mother. She vanished, Van almost vanished into thin air. Um, nobody saw her leave the market, nobody saw her talking to anybody. Um, it's as if one minute she was there, the next she's gone. And not to be found until, what, 11 months later. Hannah's body was found in a densely wooded area in Kent. She had been murdered. A rope was found around her neck. Little were we to know then that, you know, I was going to be involved in a very complex inquiry. A very, very difficult job. Very, very difficult because we had no idea who Hannah was at that time. Um, and you can imagine, the obviously there were going to be no witnesses. There's no uh, housing overlooking the scene. Um, but what we knew from this location was that the person responsible must have had local knowledge. I mean, I'd served here as a police officer uh, a number of years ago, and it was only on the, in the event of a suicide taking place that I even knew of the location beyond that railway bridge because it was just dense woodland. The discovery of Hannah's body happened quite by chance. The area was being excavated and cleared in preparation for a new rail terminal to accommodate the Eurostar train. A workman made the gruesome discovery. On that uh, Friday morning, it was tipping down with rain, obviously because of um, heavy traffic going in and out to clear the area. Um, it was literally almost knee-deep in mud. Um, you know. I, it was quite daunting because the thought of getting forensic evidence from that scene was um, probably unlikely and, and in, in time would prove to be the case. I mean, we did not get forensic evidence from that. But what we did know or suspected from um, early on was that that was a deposition site. That is not where Hannah was murdered. Hannah was brought here in a blue tarpaulin with rope brown um, and left at that location. 
the pathologist gave the cause of death as uh, strangulation because there was a rope um, around the, the young girl's neck uh, and that was the cause of death. We obviously published, there was a, quite a big um, amount of publicity, um, both local and, and national uh, news, and a reporter from South London actually phoned our incident room um, and said he thought it was Hannah Williams, um, that the body was Hannah. We obviously interviewed him quickly and he said that the clothing that we'd described and had put out um, matched that of Hannah and he'd been working um, over the months with Bernadette, Hannah's mother, in trying to push the publicity in order to try to locate Hannah um, and that really was our breakthrough. I think if I had a week heart, I think I would have been on the floor because I just like slung myself back in shock. Um, and I, I was just saying, oh my God, oh my God. Having identified Hannah, Kent police painstakingly retraced her last movements. They soon established that on the morning she went missing, she received a short call on her mobile phone from a woman who lived close to where Hannah's body was found. This woman had known Hannah's father some years previously and had in fact known Hannah for um, a number of years. But she said she didn't make that phone call because she was a night worker, a care worker in a care home, that she would have been in bed asleep at that time. So she was asked who did make that phone call. And she said, well, the only other person that could have had access to a phone was a man named Robert Howard. Robert Howard was originally from Ireland he was a drifter, and when police checked his background, his criminal record rang alarm bells. He immediately became a key suspect for Hannah's murder, and was arrested and brought in for questioning. During the period of time he was in our custody, he, he said nothing at all, just replied no comment to each question. Why would you like having sex with underage girls? No comment. Are you aware that doing sex with 15-year-old girls illegal in this country. No comment. The day after your birthday last year, she was abducted and murdered. Her body was found last Friday. Her parents have been wondering where she was for last year. She had no burial, she had nothing. She was left there. That's what we're investigating. Do you understand the importance of that? No comment. How, how many times have you met her? No comment. How many times have you met her at the North Street address? No comment. There still wasn't enough to charge Howard, and he was released. However, a search of his partner's flat and some diligent police work would uncover the crucial evidence needed. What we did locate of significance was a video showing Hannah Williams in Robert Howard's flat in South London on the 28th of February, um, so some six weeks before she'd gone missing. So now we could prove a connection between Robert Howard and Hannah. Quite often individuals who engage in serial uh, damaging behaviours take trophies along the way, take mementos along the way and make recordings of some description um, of their victims so at some stage uh, when they either are unable to reoffend, they can fill the gap, they can fill the need um, to be gratified in some way by watching a, a video such as this so it's, it's very very important. The police had linked Howard to Hannah Williams. Now they needed to link him to the scene. While investigating Howard's movements in London, they spoke with a young girl who claimed Howard had indecently assaulted her. The same girl told how Robert Howard asked her to go swimming. He brought her to the Blue Lakes. She started getting undressed, saw Robert Howard looking at her, changed her mind and said she didn't want to go swimming. But crucially, from our point of view, she, we videoed her down here 
and she pointed out to the um, railway tunnel and said Robert Howard asked her to go through there with him. And she said she looked through and it was dark and she thought it was um, quite scary, so she wouldn't go. But Robert Howard did. And he was, um, he'd gone through there and remained there for about 20 minutes. Now, with that evidence, we could show that not only did Robert Howard have local knowledge, but sometime after the disappearance of Hannah, he would have been within feet, yards, of where Hannah was later to be found. The ultimate form of power and control is death. And uh, in that sort of scenario, uh, the individual who has killed someone um, will have had his need totally assuaged. That, in his mind, will be a successful crime. And he will return again and again to the site of a successful crime because uh, essentially there uh, lies the essence of his offending uh, and the, the ultimate accolade of his offending and he will draw strength in an extremely pervasive way by being able to visit the, sign, the site of the, the death of an individual uh, or uh, where that individual's body has been disposed of. It's uh, quite often a, a very powerful force and uh, signifies ultimate control over the victim. Howard was re-arrested and charged with Hannah's murder, but with no DNA evidence, police were initially unsure about their chances of gaining a conviction. However, in the course of his investigation, Colin Murray would uncover some disturbing details about his prime suspect that would prove crucial to the case. In October 2003, Robert Howard went on trial charged with the murder of South London teenager Hannah Williams. Prosecutors applied to use a new legal technique to introduce Howard's criminal past to the jury. It was called similar fact evidence, and as a result, the trial was to be one of the most unusual in British legal history. But what you're actually looking for is the similarities between jobs, between crimes, um, and the, the, the less or the weaker the, uh, the evidence, the stronger the similar fact evidence must be, almost akin to a fingerprint, really. But the technique was relatively untested, and doubts remained about securing a conviction. Obviously, we're never confident anything can go wrong, but similar fact evidence hadn't been used in, in a murder, as I understand before. Um, it would be up to the trial judge to actually even agree whether that could be admitted. Um, if it couldn't be admitted into court, um, how damaging would that be? So there were a lot of hurdles to overcome. In the end, the judge allowed the evidence to be introduced, evidence that was gathered by Kent Police's complex and thorough investigation into Robert Howard's life. During the trial, the true extent of Howard's criminal past was revealed. Wolf Hill in the southeast of Ireland. It's here Robert Howard was born in 1944. The isolated area would lend itself to the nickname he would adopt as an adult the wolf man. Howard, pictured here age seven, was one of nine children. His father was a heavy drinker and the young Robert Howard was in trouble with the law from an early age. By 21 he had left Wolf Hill and travelled to England. As a young boy his crimes had mainly consisted of burglary, but as a young man in London his offending took a disturbing turn. In 1965, he broke into the home of a six-year-old girl and went into her bedroom and tried to sexually assault her, and he did actually hurt her. Um, he uh, didn't succeed in what he wanted to do on that occasion, so he came back uh, about a week later and again tried to uh, assault and attack this child. He was caught on that occasion, but um, quite as astonishingly, he was actually, for an offence like that, given nine days in Borstal, after which he was returned to Ireland. 
The authorities just wanted Howard off their patch. But within four years, he drifted back to England. In 1969, he was caught after he broke into the house of a young woman in Durham in the north of England and attempted to rape her. And uh, she ran screaming naked from the house and he actually pursued her and had grabbed her by the throat when neighbours came along and managed to, to get him off her. Again, Howard was simply deported back to Ireland, his violent tendencies unchecked. Clearly, you know, there was a pattern of, of, of extreme violence towards women established from quite a young age. The coastal holiday town of Yall in Ireland was a popular spot with tourists in the early 1970s. The local police sergeant remembers it as a safe and quiet place to live. However, one night in 1973, the cam would be shattered. We got a report at the Garda station that a lady had been uh, assaulted in her home the previous night. And uh, I went to the scene with a colleague of mine, and uh, it wasn't far from the Garda station. And we discovered that a lady, she had been living on her own, a 58-year-old lady. Uh, she had her own hairdressing business, and um, during the night, she had, she was, she woke up and found an intruder in her bedroom. And uh, as there was, there was a, a struggle, and she ended up anyway being raped. Uh, she was seriously injured. He took the keys of her car, plus some money, and um, he left. But before he left, he forced her back up the stairs and tied her onto the bed. Um, he, he, her mouth was gagged and, uh, so that she couldn't make noise or raise the alarm. And in the struggle, she received, she suffered a broken ankle. The ensuing manhunt led police to a guest house nearby. The owner said there was one guest who raised suspicions. During a search, the police discovered that the guest had been using a false identity and had checked in under the name Leslie Cahill. For the length of time he was in Yall, he was known as Leslie Cahill. We subsequently discovered during the morning and from, uh, we found in his bedroom that his correct name was Robert Howard. We confirmed this with the with his description, and we discovered that this man, Robert Howard, had recently been deported from England after having committed a serious sexual offence over there. By concealing his real identity, Robert Howard had managed to gain a job and find somewhere to live without anyone knowing about his past. Now, with the police on his trail, he fled on a flight to Dublin, but police were waiting for him. We realised that we're, we were dealing with a very dangerous man. I will always remember Robert Howard. Um, he was a person that you wouldn't forget when you'd meet him. Howard was charged with rape and burglary. And while on remand in Limerick Prison, he was assessed by a psychiatrist. I went down to Limerick mm -hmm. and get shown to see him in a cell. Uh, and I meet one of the most courteous, polite people I have ever met in my life before or since. Now, in my experience, people who are in prison and people who are usually chronically violent and are prone to this kind of thing, that they're crude and, and scary. This guy wasn't. In fact, I began to wonder, could I be seeing the wrong person? Or should this guy be in prison at all? Howard confessed to his crimes, and he gave the psychiatrist an insight into the darkest side of his nature. I think he has two extremes in his personality. I think he has a very nice side and a very nasty side, an explosive, dangerous side. It fits in with personality disorder of a severe type, and because it's criminal, what you call sociopathic or psychopathic, yeah, it fits with that disorder. But to be fair, anybody who has ever studied uh, or read anything about <clears throat> dangerousness the most important thing is a history of dangerousness and aggressive and dangerous behaviour and assaults and hurting people. And this guy's history was full of it. 
Dr. Dunn's report to the court was unambiguous in his assessment of Robert Howard. He advised they lock him up for good. I would have said that he was, in all probability, a dangerous and explosive psychopath. And I would also say that in my whole lifetime, practice in psychiatry, there would be very few people that I said that about, if indeed I said it about anybody else. But in the event, Howard was given 10 years in jail. He would serve just seven. By 1981, he was back on the streets. My colleagues who did also have contact with him, we felt that we hadn't seen or heard the last of Robert Howard. The remote border village of Castle Derg in Northern Ireland. Howard drifted into this village around 1990. No one here was aware of his past or how dangerous he was. In the intervening nine years, he had been married briefly and spent some time in Dublin, but little else is known. When he moved here, he took up with a local woman, Pat Quinn. She had a teenage daughter called Donna, and Howard quickly became part of Donna's circle of young friends. Mr. Howard appears to have identified a, a type of vulnerable, impressionable individual who perhaps had a very dull life, who perhaps up until the point he came into their lives had a very unfulfilled life. Um, and he would be aware of the, the deficits and deficiencies, not only in that person's life, but that person's character. And he would very, very quickly um, sweep in to fill the deficits and the deficiencies in that person's life. He set up home in a flat on Main Street. Gone was the old Howard pattern of impulsive burglaries and rape. Instead, he groomed youngsters, encouraging them to come here and party. Among them was a teenage runaway. He was nearly 50. She was just 16. Howard immediately, again showing the cunning which had been a pattern with him, <laughs> spotted that she was a young girl, you know, who was without parents and, and wanting a, a kind paternal figure in her life and he pretended to be that person. One night in 1993, Howard tricked the young girl into coming back to his flat. Her memories of what happened next become a bit hazy. She remembers having uh, a very serious headache. She remembers him giving her pills. And the next thing she remembers is waking up the following morning naked in his bed and that Howard was coming on to her. And she was horrified because that was not the way she saw him at all. And um, she tried to get away from him and he said, oh, that's not the way you were last night and proceeded to become very violent towards her. And basically he held her captive there for three days. At one stage he put a noose around her neck. Uh, she had strangulation marks around her neck. She was terrified for her life. And in fact, uh, whenever she got an opportunity, she ran upstairs and uh, there was a room in the house where he kept caged birds and she actually climbed out of the window in that room. He presented himself as a father figure without the uh, discipline, you know, so he was an attractive figure to them because he appeared to be an older man who was kind, who was understanding, who bought them presents, but he was, of course, preying upon them. He was grooming them for the violence which he always then visited on them. Howard was arrested and charged with rape. It was while he was out on bail that another teenage girl became the focus of a police inquiry. Arlene Arkinson had vanished and was last seen alone in the company of Robert Howard. Robert Howard was standing trial for the murder of 14-year-old Hannah Williams in 2001. The police investigation into Howard unraveled a life of violence that would eventually lead to murder. The prosecutor's case relied heavily on this evidence which meant Howard's shocking criminal past was revealed to the court. Arlene Arkinson was an average 15-year-old schoolgirl from the border town of Castle Derg in Northern Ireland. You had never a dull moment. <laughs> if you were crying, she would have made you laugh. 
It's just... It's funny when you look back at her, isn't mm -hmm. Always doing her hair and her makeup and... Always on the go, wasn't she? Aye, always on the go. She'd lost her mother at a very young age. Uh, she'd been vulnerable. She hadn't had a very settled upbringing since her mother's death. And uh, despite all that, her teachers in school said that she was a talented girl. She was artistic. She was willing to learn. She, her friends describe her as being a, a lovely girl, a bubbly young girl who was friendly and loyal to her friends. You know, she was, an, she was a good person. Arlene found herself in Howard's company one summer evening in 1994. She was with her sister Kathleen, but got a call from Donna Quinn, asking if she wanted to go to a disco across the border in the Irish Republic. Donna called at the house for Arlene around 11 p.m. I says, where are you going? She says, we're going to Vendon. She says, Arlene, the background too. Well, I says, um, there's an Irish pound, Arlene. Get yourself a bag of chips on the way home. And she says, Arlene, she says, Arlene kept looking away at me. And I looked, and I said, you know, putting on a coat. She said, no. I said, well, well, summer's night. I said to Donna, the dear, who's all going? She says, me, Mammy, Sean and Bob. I says, right. And she says, we're back around two o'clock. I says, see you later. But Arlene never returned home. It has since emerged that... Um, Everybody else got dropped off and uh, he then was last seen disappearing in his car with Arlene uh, somewhere between Bondorum and Castle Derg, which is very wild, mountainous, lonely countryside. And uh, Arlene has never been seen alive again. As time passed, the Arkansans became increasingly concerned about Arlene's whereabouts. Her sister made an appeal on local television. Definitely not like Arlene to be this long away. It'll be two months now on Saturday. Definitely not like her not to contact none of the family or just contact a friend or somebody. She's no clothes, no nothing wear. And she's only has new clothes bought. And like, definitely it's not like Arlene at all. Another of Arlene's sisters confronted Robert Howard at his home. She's where's our Arlene? He says, I don't know. I don't know. He says, and he just shut the door in her face. And Mary says, they're lucky to give her, like... She, she swears to that day she had a shiver. And she remember, she told you then, mm -hmm. one a week later, and tell me, she says, Arlene's dead. She says, that by there looks, you know what I mean? What was wrong, man? That was just an airy feeling she had when she banged that door that day. Their fears of Howard's involvement in their sister's disappearance were deepened when they spoke to a friendly policeman. She says, do you realise how, well, who you're dealing with here? And I says, why are you on with? Like, I was only 20, what do I know? And I says, why are you on with? And he says, I would love to put his record out there now and show you his record. But I who can't do that. Who you were dealing with? Who you were dealing with. He says, this is a bad, bad person. Yet when Howard told police he had dropped Arlene off in Castle Derg and that he had seen her in the town the following day, they believed him. He had also broken the conditions of his bail by being out late and crossing the border that night. But it would be a full six weeks after Arlene's disappearance before he was arrested and he was soon released without charge. It seems to me that uh, Robert Howard was a very clever individual in that he targeted young women who he knew were not highly prized in society. He went to poor areas. He went to places where people who are not the most highly esteemed in society live. He preyed upon vulnerable women who were typically on their own with teenage children. Um, he preyed upon those young girls, he flattered them, he made much of them. Arlene Arkinson was missing for four months and Robert Howard was the prime suspect in a possible murder inquiry when he faced court for the attack a year earlier. But incredibly, the court agreed to a plea bargain. Charges of rape and buggery were dropped. In return, 
he admitted unlawful carnal knowledge, implying consent on the victim's part. The judge ordered a psychiatric assessment of Howard. He said that if the report was satisfactory, he'd be spared jail. Just like Dr. Dunn 20 years earlier, the psychiatrist was unequivocal in his report. It appeared to me that he um, had a need to dominate and to control uh, individuals that were vulnerable and impressionable. And uh, having regard to that, I took the view that until he had fully assuaged his needs uh, or until uh, he was treated, he would continue on uh, refining and engaging in the behaviour uh, that he had engaged in to that point in time. Crucially, Dr Bones wasn't told that a rope had been used in the attack on the young girl. It was a critical piece of information and would have clearly established Howard's pattern of offending. He had a, a need to make an impression on impressionable individuals and he gained considerable gratification from that. Mm -hmm. um, that was the element of his uh, power over the person. But uh, he also had to have control over the person before he moved on to any form of sexual behaviour. And to have ultimate control and power over a person in that situation, you need to have the capacity to physically disable the individual. Um, so thus, the issue of the rope was very important. But Robert Howard walked free with a suspended sentence and the judge told him to stay away from teenage girls. I was surprised because, uh, I, as I've already mentioned, I felt that this individual fitted uh, a profile uh, of pervasive deviant needs that would continue uh, if he was not checked, if he was not treated, if he was not closely monitored uh, into the foreseeable future. fled Northern Ireland in early 1995 and started again, this time in the Drumchapel suburb of Glasgow. Claiming he was on the run from the IRA, he managed to con the authorities into giving him a house. It wasn't long before a local journalist was tipped off. Uh, we received uh, information from a senior police source that a, a, a paedophile and a man suspected of carrying out horrendous rapes, sex attacks and even murders of young children had been located uh, in a council house in Drumchapel. There's no doubt that, in the, in, to put it into context, they were treating this guy as a category, category A sex offender. It wasn't a guy that, that perhaps who, who peddled porn on the internet or were, uh, flashed at children or hung around schools. This was a guy who was a serial psychopathic offender and they were very, very concerned that he was in their area. He got an address for Howard and headed there with his photographer. To his surprise, Howard invited him into his flat. It was sparsely furnished. Uh, there was literally nothing in the flat except a bed and a few cups and tables. And we spoke to him uh, in the flat and I clearly got the impression of a guy that was uh, evil, he was disturbed. Uh, I felt very, very uncomfortable in the flat, even though I was there with my photographer colleague. And though I've been in some tricky situations in the past and some dangerous situations, I felt distinctly uncomfortable uh, being in the house with him. One of the things he did when we got into the house was he locked and snibbed the door, which uh, made me feel very uncomfortable. And to be honest with you, once we'd exchanged a few words, I'd established he was Robert Howard and uh, got a few comments from him. We quickly left the house and went back to the office. The newspaper carried the story on the front page. The reaction from the local community was swift. Within a couple of hours of the, the paper hitting the streets or hitting the supermarkets and shops, uh, he was being threatened uh, in his home uh, by local residents who were obviously appalled that such an individual had been located in their community without their knowledge and obviously somebody with such serious sexual history or history of sexual crimes. And the police were called to the house uh, later that morning and uh, removed him from the house uh, for his own pr protection. 
Edward was on the run again. This time, he headed south. I've met quite a few criminals over the years of different types, organised criminal, the sex offenders, uh, and, and people of different types and categories. But certainly I, I still get a chill when I think about the guy. It's probably the most uncomfortable I've ever felt in anybody's uh, company. The court was told how little else was known about Howard's movements in the late 1990s until he eventually settled in southeast London, carefully selecting his next victim, Hannah Williams. In fact, shortly after Howard was charged with killing Hannah, the police in Northern Ireland felt they had enough evidence to charge Howard with Arlene Arkinson's murder. It appeared as though the law was finally catching up with the wolf man. At Robert Howard's trial for the murder of Hannah Williams, his shocking 40-year criminal record had been revealed to the jury in great detail. But he continued to protest his innocence and took to the stand to defend himself. He was very articulate. I think he responded well towards the jury. Um, one could never describe him as charming, but um, quite persuasive, I suppose, in, in many ways. But what he would say, um, claim, was that he obviously hadn't killed Hannah. Um, he explained how he knew her, how he'd met her with um, his partner in uh, Deptford Market just by chance one time, um, denied ever making the telephone call, um, but we put it to him that he was responsible and he denied it throughout. For Hannah's mum, some of the details proved to be too much to listen to. I was sitting there and I'm thinking, um, listening to all bits and pieces, what, what a liar he was, what a horrible guy he was, what he had done. Um, I, I, I was just sitting there thinking, Oh my God, I, I'm thinking, this is so bad and can I take all this, can I hear it? There's parts that I couldn't hear, I had to go out. The Arkansans travelled to Kent to give evidence. For the first time, they too heard the full details of Howard's past. To get the depth, detail of what he had done, and it's only us that actually heard that in the court. And to hear that first hand on the court and looking at somebody like that and knowing, it was just sick. It took the jury just three hours to reach a verdict. Guilty. I just felt emotionally drained, really, because, you know, you never know what a jury might do. You know, it's difficult, but quite an emotional time for everybody, because this was a, a particularly... I mean, murder is bad anyway, but this was horrendous. This was a young girl going about her business, um, you know, with a probably not a care in the world at that particular time, and she's been snatched from that uh, market or lured away from that market and killed by Robert Howard. Um, and the family had been left for 11 months not knowing what had happened to Hannah. So for them, it was a, a great, great um, result, really. I was relieved that I got justice because I promised my daughter that would be the thing I would do. I would get justice for her, and he will be put away. No matter what I do, I'm going to get him put away for what he's done, not only to my daughter, but all the other people that he's interfered with and her and everything. His past was catching up on him, and they thought, everybody thought, that this would mean that justice would be done in Arlene's case as well. Uh, in fact, um, one of the Arkansan family told me that when they were leaving Kent, um, Hannah Williams' mother threw her arms around them and said, see you in Ireland, because it was assumed that uh, Mrs Williams would be called to give evidence in court in Belfast. It was the only victory we ever got for Ireland. We had no victory here. None whatsoever.
In the summer of 2005, Howard stood trial in Belfast for the murder of the missing Castle Dog schoolgirl, Arlene Arkinson. However, the decision was taken not to apply for the introduction of similar fact evidence, the technique that had proven so successful at Howard's trial in Kent. That meant the jury had no idea of his 40-year criminal record, or that he was a convicted killer. It started on the 3rd of May and was over on the 29th of June, and the not guilty came in on the 27th of June. I never forget that date. Never the day of my life. Not guilty. Jesus, my legs nearly left me. I was never, I never, I had pain in my life, but I never had pain like that. I just, I still can't get over it. I'm not, not guilty. That was a joke. And unfortunately, we were the ones that had to pick up the pieces. We were led up the garden path and just slapped the teeth at the end of it. And no harm that there is the worst sickening thing you can do to anybody. To build someone's, your hope's been built up that bad, and then to let you down sort of gently and then bang. But to protect a man with a 40 year record, to protect his past from the jury, that is beyond a joke. It's astonishing that when Robert Howard came to court in Belfast, that similar fact evidence was not called. You know, by this stage, this man had a record as long as your arm of violence against women and young girls. There was a clear pattern emerging, the type of girl he preyed upon, the lonely landscapes that he favored, the places that he took people. You know, so there was a pattern of abuse clearly established. And particularly given the fact that Arlene's body had not been found, similar fact evidence would, would have been crucial in her case. Like, where's Arlene's fair justice? There's no justice for Arlene. Like, where's her? Like, where's her fair rights? It was all for her, for all for Howard. And he's still getting protected. Still is. Like, he's lying in a cell with a colour TV, maybe a sky, shower, well fed. He doesn't even have to make his own meals. And there's Arling lying out there somewhere, we can't find her. We can't even put her in a, into a grave. Robert Howard is currently serving life for the murder of Hannah Williams here in Franklin High Security Prison in Durham. At his trial, the judge said he may stipulate that life should mean life. In the event, though, he handed down a term of just 15 years. That news came as a shock to many. I'm like, no, 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 this is like a nightmare, this can't be happening. I said, no, it's not going to happen. So I'm going to do something about it because he ain't going to get out. Oh, well, he, he, he's, if he gets out, then he will offend again and the, the justice hasn't, you know, been done. I mean, they can't let uh, an evil person like that out on the street to maybe kill another young girl or interfere with a, a baby or whatever. They can't be doing that. Well, I was surprised because I was under the impression that he'd been sentenced to life meaning life and that he would never be released from prison. But you've told me that he's, uh, and I've seen the judgment where the minimum period of time he's got to serve before parole can be considered is 15 years. But I have to say, with the record of Robert Howard, I'm not convinced a parole board would release him after 15 years anyway. At the end of 2008, the Arkinson family suffered further heartbreak when their father died. The family say he died of a broken heart. In April 2009, Arlene would have celebrated her 30th birthday. Instead, the only milestone reached is that she is missing for as long as she was alive. Her family continue to live in hope that one day they'll find her remains. It was my father's wishes to have Arlene home and give her a decent burial. Like all we have is a wee stone sitting in Mummy's grave and her father's grave now. But we have to carry on and get justice for Arlene because Arlene deserves deserves like a decent burial and like we deserve to have a life of our own 
let's see, which we haven't had as 15 years. So Robert Howard remains under lock and key. But those who've encountered him fear he still has secrets to give up. There are dangerous periods of time in Howard's history where we don't know what he was doing or where he was. And uh, there's certainly an argument to be made that um, in the cases of any young woman who disappeared during that time, that the police in all of the jurisdictions should be asking where was Robert Howard at this time. Robert Howard is clearly a very dangerous man. You only have to look at his record over the years. I believe it was 1960, the first time he offended in London, when he broke into a house uh, and attempted to rape a, a six-year-old girl. Um, now, from that time on, in my view, he's committed a, a, a number of um, offences, and it's quite likely that he's not um, answered for all of those. Um, so I think uh, Robert Howard was and will remain a very dangerous man.